everybody and welcome to the MMA Training Bible's Guide to the Blood. I'm going to be taking you through this video lecture. I'm Dr. Jason Gillis. This is what we're going to cover in this video lecture. We're going to talk about the composition of blood. We're going to talk about what red blood cells are and what they're made of. We're going to talk about blood viscosity, the thickness of the blood. And we're going to talk about the main functions of blood. So. The first thing, let's talk about the composition of blood. Now when we're talking about a unit of blood volume, um, that's really the term we're going to use. If we were to draw blood out of you and, and uh, put it in a little vial, then that's your blood volume. And your blood volume, it's composed of a couple different things. It's got plasma, which is about 55% or a little more than half of your blood volume. And then it's composed of these formed elements, all the thick stuff in your blood, the, the molecules, the, the particles. Uh, and, and the compounds that's it should be less than half of your total blood volume around 40 percent to 45 percent of your blood volume and then we have this other thing called hematocrit and you may have heard of this especially in terms of blood doping because there's some thresholds out there uh, the world anti-doping agency has for hematocrit and hematocrit is the percentage of blood volume composed of these formed elements so I want to, on the next slide, talk about um, mostly plasma and formed elements and show you some pictures and give you an idea of, of what the composition of blood is. All right, so let's first talk about plasma. Now, plasma, it's mostly water. It's about 90% water, in fact, and there's some proteins in there and there's some nutrients like getting your blood, carbohydrates, glucose, that sort of thing. Uh, what influences plasma the most? it's largely going to be influenced by your diet and primarily the amount of water that you drink or the amount of water that you don't drink. But exercise can also influence it because you sweat and, and water is going to be coming out of your plasma, moving through your skin and, and dissipating with, with heat as it evaporates and cooling your skin. So you can influence sweat rate through your training status. You can also influence that through uh, how acclimated you are to the heat. So. Uh, when you go through a cutting protocol, when you're trying to cut weight and make weight for a fight, then you're primarily shifting, at first, uh, your, the amount of water in your plasma. So that's gonna be really important for you to understand. And there's gonna be uh, danger zones for how much water that you can lose or how much water you, you can lose before your performance is affected, depending upon the type of performance you're doing, and ultimately whether you, you die or not. So, this plasma volume, it's pretty important and, and the amount of um, stuff in it is a pretty important indicator of how your body regulates certain functions. Uh, and the amount of stuff in your blood, it's mostly what we're going to be calling formed elements. So we talked about plasma. Let's move on to talk about that bottom bit, formed elements. The biggest amount of formed elements in your blood, the most formed elements there, it's going to be red blood cells. So for plasma, mostly water, formed elements in the blood, it's just gonna be chock full of red blood cells, and that's 99% of the formed elements in your blood. But you're also gonna have white blood cells, and you're also gonna have what are called platelets. But by and large, it's red blood cells. That's really what, what's taken up most of the space in, in, in there for formed elements. Okay, let's look at some pictures, because I think, uh, if you're like me, this will really help you understand what we're talking about. And this is really just a picture version of the last slide. So on the left-hand slide here, or on the left-hand side of the slide, we're looking at a scanned electron microscope of just normal circulating human blood. And we've got all sorts of formed elements in there. You're seeing a lot of red blood cells because now you know that that's 99% of, of uh, the formed elements in there. But they're floating around in this stuff and that's plasma. Now, if you're to take a sample of blood, it's gonna be fairly evenly distributed like that. But if you put it in a centrifuge and spin it around at really high speeds, it's going to cause a separation. So you're gonna get all the formed elements uh, separating from, from the plasma. And that's what we're seeing on the right. So if we were to take that blood, centrifuge it, then we can see a separation here. And so what we're seeing at the top of this test tube of this, of this blood, this total blood volume, which this is all blood volume, we're seeing about 55% of the blood volume is plasma and most of it is gonna be water. And you see there's some other uh, plasma proteins in there as well. And then we're looking at the formed elements section which should be less than 50%, so around 45%, let's say. And it's mostly gonna be red blood cells. So you can see red blood cells. It's mostly what we're seeing over here in this other image on the left. And if we wanna calculate hematocrit, it's just the percent of formed elements 
versus the total blood volume. So really, um, it's, it, it's largely gonna be influenced by the amount of red blood cells that you have then, right? So formed elements, um, it's gonna be the total percentage of, of uh, the total blood volume. So a normal uh, percentage uh, for hematocrit, it's gonna be around 45% or so. Uh, it shouldn't be over 50. And, and we're gonna talk about um, WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, and their threshold for what's a normal hematocrit uh, it can it can vary a little bit, but it's going to be around 50 or so. So let's talk about red blood cells. Well, red blood cells is really the largest formed element in in the total blood volume. It's really making up your most of your hematocrit, the percentage there. And what's the purpose of a red blood cell? Well, it's to pick up oxygen at your lungs and to transport that oxygen to the tissue. There's no nucleus in a red blood cell, so it can't reproduce. So red blood cells, they're gonna be produced and destroyed at about equal rates, and they have a lifespan of only around four months or so. Now you may ask how they're created. Well, they're created in bone marrow by the use of a specific hormone, uh, EPO, or erythropoietin, uh, which comes from around the kidneys or so. So EPO, it's responsible for acting on bone marrow to increase red blood cell formation. But like I say, they can't reproduce themselves. Red blood cells, importantly, they contain something called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is really, really important. So what is hemoglobin? Well, let's separate those words. We got the heme and then we got the globin. The globin is the protein. And the heme, it's everything else. It's the pigment and the iron and the oxygen. But it's held all together by this by these um, glob uh, globin proteins. So what's the point of hemoglobin? Well, hemoglobin, it's really what's responsible for binding on to oxygen and holding it in that red blood cell. And specifically, you're gonna hold four oxygen molecules for each hemoglobin. And in total, in each red blood cell, this is almost impossible to imagine in your head, but try to visualize it. You have 250 million hemoglobin per one red blood cell. So you can actually work out the total amount of oxygen that you can carry in your blood. And, and it works out to be, if you were to draw about 20 milliliters of, uh, or 100 milliliters of blood, you're gonna have about 20 milliliters of oxygen in that blood. So let's have a look at the picture. So on the left here, we're looking at a red blood cell. Again, it's a, a scanned electron uh, micrograph of several red blood cells, but we're just gonna focus on uh, the inside of one of these. And what we're looking at here on the right, this is one hemoglobin uh, molecule. And just imagine, in this one little red blood cell, uh, we have 250 million of these. It's really remarkable. And so what we're looking here is we have the globin uh, and it's the different protein structures that hold uh, the hemoglobin together and hold uh, the heme that hold the iron and hold the oxygen in place. And so you can see where oxygen is held at these uh, heme and these iron sections right here. So you see four oxygen uh, molecules for each one hemoglobin in total. So let's talk about another important characteristic of blood, it's the blood viscosity. And when we talk about viscosity, it's just the thickness of the blood. You can think about it maybe with your car and your oil and your engine. The viscosity, it's just gonna be increased viscosity with increased oil thickness. So in the human body, we're talking about the thickness of blood. Increased viscosity is increased thickness of blood. So what do you think is gonna influence the viscosity of blood? Well, it's gonna be formed elements and, and primarily red blood cells. Uh, in general, blood is about twice as thick or viscous as water. And again, this is gonna be primarily due to the hematocrit. And as I said before, normal hematocrit is gonna be 42 to 44%, but definitely less than 50%. And it's primarily influenced by the number of red blood cells and the total blood volume. So can you change it? Can you change hematocrit? Can you change the viscosity of blood? Well, um, of course you can. You can change it a couple different ways. And as an athlete, you wanna be concerned with how you can increase uh, viscosity, increase the number of red blood cells in your, in your blood, increase the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. And you can do that with training, but you are gonna increase the viscosity, but it really doesn't change that much. 
And this is a pretty important thing. When you train, you can increase the number of red blood cells, but you're really not going to see a, a big change in the hematocrit. So you may be scratching your head saying, well, how does that happen? How come you can increase the number of red blood cells in your blood with training, but you don't see a, a huge change in hematocrit? Well, it's because as you train, your body naturally secretes different hormones, one being EPO or erythropoietin, that will stimulate the uh, increase of red blood cell formation, and you're naturally going to be able to carry more oxygen that way. It's a great adaptation of training. But what happens is the watery bit of your blood, the plasma volume, it will increase uh, as you're, you increase red blood cell production to maintain your percentage hematocrit. And in some cases, it can even drop a little bit. And this ultimately prevents the increase in uh, blood viscosity, which can actually be pretty dangerous and life-threatening. So let's give you a little example here. And this example is taken from a textbook, uh, The Physiology of Sport and Exercise. It's exercise physiology text. And so on the left-hand side, we're looking at a pre-training sample of blood. And let's say that it's uh, five liters of blood. And, and that's about normal for what a human in total will, would, would have. And, and about, about a normal hematocrit uh, for someone is gonna be around 44% or so. And you can see this is gonna be primarily due to the, the red blood cells or about 2.2 liters of red blood cells and the plasma volume, which is about 2.8 liters. And so this is your total blood volume. And, and when, you, when you calculate the hematocrit, which is just a percentage of formed elements versus the total plasma or total blood volume, then um, you get 44%. But as you start to train, uh, erythropoietin will cause an uh, increase in production of red blood cells and bone marrow, and that will increase your, your red blood cell uh, count. So what you see is with training, we're looking at the, the, the vial on the right now, you're gonna see an increase in red blood cells. So you can see here, it went up from 2.2 liters to 2.4 liters. But what happens is your plasma volume, the amount of uh, water in your blood will also increase. And so you see uh, it increased from 2.8 liters to 3.3 liters. And what this does, this helps to maintain and actually reduce the viscosity of your blood. So in this example here, uh, original hematocrit was 44%, or the, the percentage of this stuff versus the, all of the, the volume of this whole vial, 44%. And you see here, hematocrit, it's actually gone down. Even though red blood cell count has increased, uh, we have saw such an increase in plasma volume that the, the percentage of these formed elements versus the whole, uh, the whole blood volume uh, has actually decreased. So we end up seeing a decrease uh, in, in hematocrit around 42%. So what does this tell you about athletes? Well, the more you train, you should see an expansion of plasma volume and you definitely should, shouldn't see uh, hematocrit go up too much with, uh, with athletes unless they're blood doping. So let's talk about blood doping because it's a pretty important thing in sport, especially in certain sports. So uh, this is a little screenshot of the World Anti-Doping anti Agency or WADA. And this is a little uh, frequently asked questions section. You see there's a whole bunch of different areas that you can, you can learn about, but we're interested in blood doping. And, and what's their definition of blood doping? They say blood doping is the misuse of certain techniques and or substances to increase one's red blood cell mass which allows the body to transport more oxygen to muscles and therefore increases stamina and performance. So you can check that out on your own if you go to WADA. Um, so what we're saying here is blood doping is when you increase red blood cell mass without this concaminant change in plasma volume. So you end up seeing increase in formed elements and increase in the hematocrit. Now this, without a doubt, can increase endurance performance because you're increasing the amount of oxygen that you can carry and your, your muscles need oxygen. But blood flow or oxygen, it may suffer the transport of it through your body. And what I really want you to know and pay attention to is it can increase the chance of heart disease and stroke and cerebral and pulmonary emboli. So it's a very dangerous thing that you're focusing on here if you're, if you're blood doping. So uh, let's, um, let's give you a little example of this here. So this is the image that we just looked at. And so what we're looking at here, I'll just refresh your, your memory again. Um, 
On the left, we're looking at pre-training values, and then on the right, we're looking at post-training values. So let's assume that we have an athlete who, um, who decided to, to blood dope. And there's a couple of different ways that you can blood dope. One is by, um, one is by injecting EPO. So let's write this on here. Uh, EPO, there you go. Erythropoietin, injecting this hormone. Um, another way that you can blood dope uh, is by uh, infusing red blood cells into your own blood. So what people do here is they actually draw their own blood out uh, and uh, what will happen is you'll, you'll actually take your own blood out and put it in the fridge uh, and store it and preserve it and then your body will rebound and it would increase the number of red blood cells uh, in order to account for the reduction of the blood that was just taken out. And then what you'll do is you'll then take that um, take those red blood cells, that bag of blood, and then you'll infuse it back into your body and you'll, you'll effectively increase the, the red blood cell content. So let's take the example of, of post-training here. Um, so what you have here is this athlete, they've, they've gone through training and they've expanded uh, their, their red blood cell uh, count and they've expand, expanded their plasma volume as well. But if they blood dope, then what they're gonna do here is they're not gonna expand their plasma volume anymore, but what they're gonna do is they're gonna increase this number. Uh, they're gonna increase all the way up here. So let's say that now they've increased the amount of red blood cells in their blood. And so what you see here is you see a, an increase in this number. You see an increase in hematocrit because now it represents a greater percentage of the total blood volume. And what a Sorry, writing like a serial killer. I hope you'll have to excuse that. Um, WADA has a criteria of around 50% for hematocrit. So if you're over 50%, then um, you'll probably be, uh, be charged with blood doping uh, and the cause will be one of, these, one of these two methods here. So I hope that you understand what blood doping does now uh, and, and hopefully some of the dangers that are associated with blood doping. Okay, let's now move on to talk about the main functions of blood. And there's gonna be three main functions that we wanna talk about here. There's transportation, there is acid-base balance, or pH, uh, and there's body temperature regulation. We're gonna deal with each one of those in turn in the next couple slides. So what's the main things that the blood is transporting? It's primarily gonna be three. You're looking at the blood transporting nutrients, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. So the type of nutrients that the blood is transporting, it's gonna be the things that you eat. There's gonna be carbs in there, like glucose. There's gonna be proteins and amino acids. There's gonna be fat in there, uh, fatty acids, uh, triglycerides, things of that nature. It's also gonna be importantly transporting oxygen, which is gonna be inhaled in the lungs, and as the blood moves over the lungs, that uh, oxygen, it's dissolved in the plasma, and it's also bound to hemoglobin, as we've already seen. And then that oxygen is gonna be delivered to tissue where it's gonna be taken up by things like muscles, and it's gonna be used to generate energy, ATP. And then finally, it transports carbon dioxide. So as a byproduct of, of the, the tissues, the muscles using oxygen, they will put out carbon dioxide and that's a, a really a waste product of, uh, of cellular respiration. And so this CO2, it's gonna be moving from the muscle or the tissues into the blood and it's gonna be dissolved into the plasma, so it's just floating free. But it's also gonna be bound to red blood cells. Specifically in those red blood cells, there's uh, bicarbonate, uh, and carbaminal compound. And bicarbonate, you may have heard of athletes supplementing with bicarbonate to try to increase CO2 buffering or lactic acid buffering. Uh, and th the research is really out whether that works or not, but um, in some studies it does, in some studies it doesn't. It depends on what you're doing and how you take it. But in any case, the carbon dioxide is gonna be moving from the tissue into the blood uh, and the red blood cells, and it's gonna be released at the lungs and you, you breathe it out. So that's really the main function of blood transportation, nutrients, oxygen, and carbon dioxide movement. Okay, so let's talk about the acidity of the blood, uh, acid-base balance. 
In general, you may have heard of pH before. pH, it's a measure of acidity or alkalinity of something. In general, uh, you can have a high acidity, which is associated maybe counterintuitively with a low pH. So something that's highly acidic has a low pH, like around zero or so. So think of gastric acids. Uh, alternatively, something that's very alkaline, it has a very high pH. So you're talking about soapy water or, or, or bleach, and that is gonna have a high pH of around 14. To give you an idea, the tolerable limits of pH for the blood, it's gonna be 6.9 to 7.5, so it's regulated in a very narrow range. And what changes the acidity of the blood? Well, it's gonna be due to hydrogen ions, which they're also a byproduct of cellular respiration and, and exercise and metabolism, and just breaking ATP down can release hydrogen ions, which can increase the acidity inside the muscle. When you exercise lactic acid, uh, ultimately is going to be buffered, hydrogen ions are going to be buffered in the blood, specifically in red blood cells, uh, and they act to lower the acidity of the blood and, and ultimately transport um, the acidity uh, towards the lungs where you ultimately breathe it off. So uh, that's one of the important functions of the blood is to maintain acid-base balance. And probably uh, the most interesting uh, function of blood, from my perspective, because I'm a trained environmental physiologist, and I deal with how the body regulates deep body temperature, uh, it's body temperature regulation. That's really one of the important elements of blood. Uh, what happens when you exercise your, your muscles, they generate heat, and that heat is gonna be absorbed in the blood and pumped around the body, and ultimately it'll be pumped towards the skin and then that heat will dissipate from the skin to the environment. And on the right here, you're just looking at a little thermographic image taken from a thermal camera uh, during an experiment that I conducted uh, some years ago. Uh, and you could just see really what this shows you is uh, the cold areas, which are dark, uh, and then the hot areas, which are uh, golden and white. Uh, in this case, you can see the temperature ranges from 30 to 36 or 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's it for this video lecture. It was just a quick little overview on the blood. Uh, we talked about the composition of blood, the plasma volume, the formed elements, and the hematocrit. We talked about uh, red blood cells, primarily hemoglobin. We talked about blood viscosity and the influence of training and a little bit about blood doping. And then we talked about the main functions of blood for transportation, for acid-base balance, and for temperature regulation. And that's really all I wanted to cover in this video. So I hope you learned a couple things. If you want more information, more general videos, uh, video lectures, uh, information on combat sports, mixed martial arts, and training and the science of it all, then go over to the MMATrainingBible.com. You can also send me a message and, uh, and, and hopefully I'll be able to, to get to it and answer it. So that's it for this video. I hope you got something out of it and we'll, we'll see you next time.